In previous lectures, we looked at how to build large phylogenies or small ones, what kind of data to collect for them, what sort of data formats are used in phylogenetics, and we played around a little bit with some tree traversal in very large trees that you might load in a database. In this brief lecture, I will do a quick review of some of the other large phylogenies that are out there for reuse in our research. So just as a quick recap, I will uh, reiterate why we would care about large phylogenies at all outside of the realm of systematics. I will then go over some projects that synthesize large phylogenies for reuse, either on an ad hoc basis, just as a single publication, or as ongoing projects. And finally, how to use such big trees and what kind of tooling exists for them. So firstly, why would we care at all about large phylogenies outside systematics? Of course, such large trees tell us something about the process of diversification. So how does biological diversity uh, accumulate over time? We looked very briefly at this in the context of species delimitation and uh, the accumulation of lineages, for example, when we um, work uh, with uh, the uh, GMYC species delimitation algorithm. We'll look a bit more at that, uh, at this kind of analysis in later lectures. Also, we have uh, gone at length over the issue of taxa not being independent from one another, because all life is related, so that in comparative analysis, we cannot simply compare species without taking phylogeny into consideration as a source of covariation among taxa. Now finally, and we haven't really gone over this yet, uh, we can also use very large phylogenies as an indicator of phylogenetic diversity, such that when we compare, for example, different uh, points in space, so different areas, or maybe in time, for example, through the seasons, or before or after a great big event, what has changed and which parts of the tree are more or less represented as a kind of indicator of beta diversity, so the turnover in terms of the coverage on a tree. Here now a couple of phylogenies that have been published in very high impact papers and that we might see uh, be cited and reused uh, many times over. So for example, here's one, ex uh, one tree, such tree which is the super tree of the mammals. So this is already a little bit older, um, but it's still used very often. And we saw it, for example, being used in the uh, brief tutorial for how to analyze hoofed animals and their range sizes as a function of geographical latitude. This is a tree that was built by combining very many other previously published trees, and that is called a super tree method. So it's not super in the sense that you know it's super duper awesome. Uh, it's super in the sense that it's the super set of input trees. And this came up in another context as well, when I talked about the uh, summary that one of my students had made of the trees in tree base. That was also a super tree method. This tree was then uh, calibrated using uh, molecules, so a kind of molecular clock approach, which were uh, further scaled and calibrated using fossils. Actually, the point of this paper was to demonstrate that the diversification of mammals uh, already got underway before the KT boundary, so the great big rock that fell from the sky and killed the dinosaurs, um, but just as a database of uh, the phylogeny of mammals, it is being used in many other contexts as well. Here's another example. This is uh, a tree for the birds. So again, this uh, tree is uh, 
quite commonly cited. This is also because there's a web resource associated with it called Bird Tree. Now this tree is not a super tree. This is uh, based mostly on molecular data, which was then calibrated using relaxed molecular clocks. And here uh, the paper was uh, basically had as its main story to show when bird diversification rates changed. So this was about 50 million years ago. But again, this tree is also used for, for example, comparative analyses, but then in birds. Here's another example. This is a tree for plants. And here this paper also um, showed kind of a, a comparative study. Here what was looked at is what were the traits that allowed plants to colonize colder environments, so move into uh, areas of the world where there's uh, frost in the wintertime. This tree was based on molecular data and then on that data were superimposed trees, uh, traits, and uh, ecological data. Now these are just some examples of this, but there's also other ones that are not just papers that came out at some particular point, but they're more like ongoing initiatives where that have uh, data sets that are uh, constantly improving. So, for example, in uh, the case of um, molecular biodiversity uh, of bacteria and uh, archaea, there's a couple of initiatives that maintain large curated data sets. So, for example, Silva uh, comprises a data set of 16S and 18S sequence data uh, of uh, ribosomal sequences and uh, green genes is a 16S data set and both of these are also used uh, not just as a tree but also as a sequence data set that you might for example blast against to uh, identify what's in an environmental sample. Other very large uh, tree initiatives are for example the Tree of Life web project, which is more a classic systematics initiative where uh, clades on the uh, backbone of the Tree of Life are maintained and improved by taxonomic experts. So this is also uh, commonly used for teaching, for example. The address is tollweb.org and it's a very nice website. Uh, another community effort is the APG phylogeny, the uh, Angiosperm Phylogeny Working Group, which goes through a, a series of releases that uh, try to establish a backbone of the phylogeny of flowering plants on the basis of phylogenetic systematics. And finally, an interesting uh, initiative is the Open Tree of Life, which sees the uh, assembly of the Tree of Life as kind of an open source project. So for this, there's a whole uh, infrastructure that's been constructed such that uh, researchers can contribute to this ongoing initiative and increasingly refine the Tree of Life. Here's kind of how this works. So the Open Tree of Life project is uh, built around a kind of complica complicated uh, infrastructure where uh, published trees are collected in a online repository on GitHub and uh, those trees are curated and filtered and prioritized in various ways and they are anchored on uh, external taxonomies so uh, multiple taxonomies are ingested and kind of merged to build a consensus taxonomy called the OTT. And these uh, trees and the taxonomy are then combined in a type of database that operates on networks. So this is not a relational database, but this is more a graph database uh, implemented in a system called Neo4j. And what that gives the developers is the ability to traverse the 
uh, different possible tree shapes and try to come up with different uh, solutions or paths through it that might be supported by a particular type of data or by a particular uh, sources to then extract some kind of uh, consensus out of this or some kind of subtree or also be able to traverse it to reconstruct why some taxa are grouped together on the basis of what evidence, for example. Now, each of these trees are very, very large. And so we already seen that this raises some uh, challenges. I mean, we can't really just look at these trees or do things by hand. Uh, so we would have to, uh, I guess, program against them, write some scripts against them and uh, make them basically conform to the other data that we want to analyze on these trees. And a bunch of these operations come back time and, uh, time and again. So, for example, one of these, uh, which is a very common problem in our line of research, is the issue of taxonomic name resolution. So what is the issue here? Well, different databases often use their own uh, taxonomic naming scheme. So, for example, when you collect occurrence data from something like GBEF, well, that might use different taxonomic names than, for example, trade data from, let's say, the Encyclopedia of Life Trade Bank. And then when we take any of those data to our phylogeny, well, then maybe the tips in the tree are again labeled with other names. So what then needs to happen is to try to resolve whether these different names are maybe synonyms of each other um, or just alternative spellings or maybe they are actually slightly different species concepts so there's a whole bunch of services that help with that type of resolution and i'll show a couple of these in a minute then secondly well your tree might be so uh, very large that it actually uh, goes way beyond uh, the set of tips for which you have data. So probably you want to prune your tree down to just the set of taxa that you're interested in. And for this, there's various tools that allow you to just extract the subtree uh, out of that large tree. And then finally, it might also happen that actually, even though you found a very large tree to reuse, it might be the case that still a couple of taxa are missing. So then you basically have to do the opposite of pruning and graft some more tips into this. So grafting, by the way, is this operation. So normally we're talking about this in the context of real trees, where, for example, in fruit trees, you might graft one tree on top of the other, and hopefully they uh, stay alive and uh, uh, grow happily together. Now, uh, in the case of taxonomic name resolution, here's uh, just a small sampling of all the different data sources that might help you figure out whether various names are maybe synonyms or not um, with each other. Now, this is, seems like a whole lot of work to have to consult all these different databases but uh, things have got a little bit better uh, recently. For example, there's a, an R package called TaxSize that uh, talks to all these different uh, application programming interfaces, APIs, to help you resolve these naming issues. So a lot of this is actually boiling down to uh, scripting to try to sort out these different uh, issues. Then, Beyond that, well, if we can figure out the names, then there's still the issue of uh, grafting our tree down to some set of names that maybe we are interested in. And this could be for a variety of uh, reasons. Uh, so um, lately there have been some community initiatives to uh, try to make kind of generic services that can present a subtree from a very large tree. And then the idea was, well, imagine if there's, for example, a piece of text that contains multiple uh, species names. 
well, perhaps then some services can recognize that there are species names in these texts, scrape them out of the text, create a nice uh, clean list of the names, and then present a tree for those taxa in the list. And here's some uh, examples of initiatives that have been trying to enable that. Um, a first one that's been around for a while now uh, is called Philomatic and comes from the uh, botanical community. So there, uh, this tool is, is basically a standalone piece of software that actually uses the uh, APG backbone tree to uh, prune it where it needs to be pruned. So just to give you only the tips that you're interested in. And then if there's additional tips that you want in there, you can define as input a kind of path that says, well, I know that this is a species that belongs to this genus and then in that family. And then the tool manages to graft that species into the tree. Obviously then that creates polytomies and no brain slangs. But this was a very popular tool. So then uh, in response to that, to try to deal with some of these things that hadn't really been taken care of yet in the tool, so this brain length issue, for example, um, a uh, larger uh, project was initiated called Philotastic, uh, the successor to Philomatic, which uh, has as a goal to um, be able to operate on uh, different trees and to also resolve the taxon naming issues and improve on the pruning and grafting and dating challenges, so dating in uh, branch lengths uh, and uh, node ages. And then finally, uh, another uh, tool which um, we uh, might play a bit with indirectly is this uh, S -Philo Maker, which uh, has also released a very large plant tree and that's actually the tree that we've been playing with when we were using the relational database to compute the uh, phylogenetic uh, distances between our different crop species. Now, as a toolkit, the, that latter one, as PhyloMaker, uh, I found was a little bit buggy, but uh, the tree is uh, pretty large, and so that one is also sometimes used as a reference tree. So these are just some examples of where you might find very large trees and then what you might do with them. I hope this was useful. Thank you for listening.